Welcome to The X-Files, a special edition podcast from Full Prefrontal. We love stories because they take us to the secret hidden places where we store the essence of real living. Only through stories do we witness extraordinary moments of human resilience. In these special edition episodes, we hear the stories of former clients, learning about their gifts, challenges, aspirations, letdowns, and inner activism. The clients presented in The X-Files have helped Sucheta become a better listener, observer, problem solver, and above all, a caring clinician. She hopes these stories will melt your heart and help you see executive function in a new light. And now, here is our host, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome to The X-Files. Over the years, I have had an opportunity to work with incredible individuals and some very young, some on the brink of discovering the world and some older who have taken setback and would like to get their life back in order. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing one of my favorite clients who I worked with four years ago. And the reason I feel she's going to add great value to the listeners is her journey began at a very young age, but the way she has stayed the course and handled the challenges, they didn't even seem to interfere with her life until she began to seriously consider her life's goals as a college student. She and I met when she was in college, so she'll tell us about that. But now she is a beautifully, fully engaged individual. She is newly married. She's a college graduate and she is working as a middle school math and science teacher and she's changing lives as we speak every day. So I can't wait to see where we take this conversation. Welcome to the show, Ansley. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So let's start the conversation with this simple question. Can you tell our listeners, what were your challenges or what were you experiencing that created roadblock in your success, whether it was in grade school or towards the end of your high school or in college? Well, I can think back to when I was very, very young. I was always almost my worst enemy. I constantly beat myself up if I didn't make the best grades. For some reason, I had this uh, mentality that I had to be number one or else it was failure. So I had those experiences at a very young age, which really affected my anxiety levels too, always feeling that pressure that I have to be the best. And I managed to squeak through grade school with that attitude. My mom was always never worried. I made the good grades. It was good. But I had to work really hard. And when I got to college, that's when I really hit a roadblock, I guess you could say, where I wasn't number one. And that was something that I really had to come to terms with, but I didn't know how. And I was unable to find my purpose, what path I wanted to take. And I felt like I was surrounded by people that knew exactly what they wanted to do. And I was just all alone and that I'd screwed up my entire life. <laughs> so, you know, what really speaks to my heart about that is I think you are painting a picture of a very non-traditional way somebody would consider difficulty or disability because on the surface, you were getting the top grades when you were younger. You were in the gifted program. And I'm going to have you talk a little bit about that. But you had high standard scores, but what you're describing is enormous amount of effort or focus that you had to put in, which was not your strength. And that created a great amount of anxiety. So tell us a little bit about what kind of your daily learning experience was as a student when you were going through these academic experiences. First, when I was striving to be number one, I can't even tell you how much studying I did. It was pretty much rote memorization. And luckily, it was before Common Core. So it was just all straight up memorizing things, making flashcards. I really just drained myself trying to prepare for the next test, trying to memorize a speech perfectly. Just things that were not that necessary. And I feel like I missed out on a lot of fun social aspects of my younger life in order to stay on top. But I would pull all-nighters. I would write papers, throw them away until I found a better topic because I didn't like the first one. And then I would just run out of time and have to panic mode and get something in. I mean, those are some hard struggles I had in high school and middle school that I can recall. Got it. So again, what you're pointing out, which is there's a cost associated with trying to be number one. And you also, I think what I noticed is you were working hard, but you were not strategic or you're not working smart. And probably even knowledge that there's another way to do it. It was not really part of what you had come across. So tell us a little bit about your diagnosis of ADHD and uh, 
uh, you had some other challenges that you were dealing with as a student. So in high school, there were certain years, and I say years because it happened many times, where I would just miss 30, 40 days of school. I came from a very good home. It wasn't like there was a social worker type problem, but it appeared as that way. You know, as a teacher now, I would be concerned about a child like me. But it was just anxiety, other health issues like hypothyroidism that I was struggling to deal with. And my family didn't really know where to start. It just seemed like a whole bunch of issues. And we were having trouble pinpointing, like, which doctor do we see? Do we check her blood? Do we do this? Do we do that? And so I was in and out of the doctors all the time. I did not know about ADHD yet. In second grade, my mother had me tested. I did not remember this, but they said I had ADHD and she never wanted to medicate me, which is common with a lot of parents, you know, even now. And so she just didn't really ever make it a thing. So I was completely unaware that I had ADHD until a later age when I was in college. I had a teacher in my uh, genetics class at Furman. She approached me and said, you know, you're missing out on some important things. You're um, zoning out. It's very unlike you for such a hardworking student to make a zero on a quiz or show up unprepared for a test. And when I told her I had no idea, I didn't know that we had one today, she just gave me this funny look and was like, you might have some attention problems. (laughs) You need to go see the counselor. So I did do that. And they told me, yeah, I bet you have ADD. We need to get you on medication ASAP. And I thought that was a quick fix. Later, years later, I found out it was not. But for a long time, I thought that was a magic cure is getting medicated for a problem that I had. My mom agreed in second grade at a young age. You showed that you had symptoms of ADHD. They're saying this now, this must be a problem. So that was the plan at the time. So honestly, it looks like your parents knew you had an ADHD. And I want to kind of share with our listeners that your diagnosis you had was ADHD inattentive type. And the inattentive type versus hyperactive type, there are two different types. And typically, girls tend to have more of symptoms of an inattentive type, which makes you spacey, not quite focused, as you were mentioning, working really hard. But unlike, you know, you're not not paying attention, you're just space going in and out, zoning in, zoning out. But do you think that was a big disservice? Or I mean, of course, I don't think your parents knew in a certain way, but not knowing you had the diagnosis and not getting treated for it and then going through life without really having proper attention or guidance. It wasn't until later that you discovered you truly have, for example, your family knew all along was ADHD. Right. And the way they saw it when I asked them about that is, hey, you were making really good grades. So we weren't concerned it was a learning deficit at all. So the good grades masked their view that I could actually really have a problem in the future with this diagnosis. So I was able to hide that from them, I guess, pretty well and myself. But I developed some pretty bad habits that really caught up to me in college. So can you give us some examples of how did this ADHD as a young adult show up in your life, which was not necessarily limited to academics? My inability to commit to not only a topic on a paper, but also to plans with friends, like fun, social things. I couldn't make up my mind on what I wanted to do. I was always flippant, but I always tried to justify it to myself by saying, hey, that makes me more fun or, oh, I'm a Gemini. It's okay. (laughs) I was just (laughs) all over the place. And I just really tried to bury myself and whatever didn't require much work at all. Like if I got overwhelmed with something, I was very impulsive and I would go do something else, the complete opposite of what I should do because it was fun. It'd make me feel better for that moment. But then later I would kind of go into a down, really go into a downward spiral because I knew that the decision I had made was not a good one. And now I was beating myself up about it and felt like I was digging myself in a hole. So it was a dark place that I was in a lot through college, beating yourself up, saying, I know I'm smarter than this. My mom always said I was smart. I made A's. But then it gets to the point where you're like, well, am I really smart or am I just dumb? And that's right about when I came to you when I was just so frustrated, not knowing if I was intelligent or not, not knowing if I'd be successful. So that was my experience as a young adult with my ADD. And thank you for being so candid about that, Ansley. I think what you're describing is this indecisiveness, inability to formulate the big picture uh, for self, having the capacity to flexibly shift between different different sets of goals that one has or needs to pursue as you are living a multifaceted life. You're also describing some of this lack of clarity, which often leads to confusion 
And so people don't really think deep about a process of taking a decision and following through and yielding success that you need. So until they are in that moment. And so particularly what I know from having worked with such individuals is the paper kind of becomes real at 2 a.m. and then you spend next yeah. six to eight hours. <laughs> but because yeah. of that, you have missed a, a test that was next day or something like that. So there's yeah. an imbalance too, right? Absolutely. Um, so how did or when did you first hear the term executive function or executive function disorder? Tell us about that. Okay. I was seeing my psychiatrist who I had been seeing I don't know, probably for about five years at that time. And he was consistent. He prescribed me medication. I was very diligent about meeting with him. He was keeping track of me. And it was at the point where we were both like, what do we do now? We've tried everything. <laughs> and he was like, well, not everything. And my mom was sitting in this meeting with my psychiatrist. He had mentioned executive dysfunctioning. And I'm like, what? What is that? <laughs> is there medication for that? Is it a cure-all? Like, am I going to be fixed instantly? And he said, he recommended your name. And he told me to look into it. And as soon as I went home and started researching about it, I felt like the internet finally understood me. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and then I made that call to you, which changed everything for me. So, I mean, I'm glad you uh, took me in as a client because that is just life-changing for me and my parents, family, friends, everybody. Well, I distinctly remember the first session that we had and it was such a tear filled and my heart was aching as you were describing this challenge that you really thought it was some sort of personal fault of yours or a bad personality or character flaw. And it gave me such great joy to explain to you, no, this is the way your brain works and you can actually work around your brain. <laughs> so right. I'm so happy that we, we got together. So tell us a little bit about what have you come to understand from our conversation and as you have grown and develop a deeper understanding of executive function, what does this disability present itself, the executive function disorder? Uh, the biggest setback I have with this disability is really just being an advocate for myself. So that's something that I've really taken away from working with you. You taught me how not to be a victim of a bad personality, I guess you will. <laughs> but, um, to actually like go out there and see what you can do, but not only do that, but do it in a way that doesn't make you want to like go to the hospital with a panic attack. You gave me tools so I could do big things with small goals and just building on each other. And that's just something that that was it for me. That's what changed everything. I felt like I was confident, I was capable, and that I was going to have a happy, successful life. And so far, I'm doing good. I feel like I'm very, very happy. <laughs> oh, I am so proud of you for what you have accomplished. And I will never forget. I hope one day I will be there in the audience when you'll be giving a speech. But you had said <laughs> that you know you can see of becoming a principal and becoming educational leader. So I'm really hoping that's where I will see you. <laughs> I, hope so. I hope so. I'm working towards it. Small goals. <laughs> uh, small goals, small goals. So tell us a little bit about my observation about the way you presented your difficulties was it was very interesting that I think I heard from as I took intake interview that you were quite often found yourself very anxious. You were not very willing or able to move from one activity to another activity. You felt compelled to finish it even when you were not having success. And you simply, I mean, what's striking to me was your determination, but it was not being utilized well. Unlike some other clients that I work with who actually don't even have that kind of motivation. So that helped you, but it didn't really help you to feel good about what you were doing. The thing that was quite striking to me was organized thinking. You didn't have a concept of passage of time. I like to describe this as a time deafness and pattern blindness. One of the ways people who are organized or they organize themselves is to predict patterns that repeat themselves and see a harmony in chaos. And you literally thought, the world was a bucket full of goodies. <laughs> and I think you just needed a new lens to look at it. You're completely capable of looking at it that way, but you just had not done that. Another thing that was quite interesting to me was study strategies. As a college student, you had never looked at the process of studying in a different way. For example, looking at a question, we spend a lot, lot of sessions discussing and evaluating and creating this framework for you where what is the intention behind this question? What is it that somebody else wants that they want to get out of you that you need to present your understanding, right? And that perspective was just something you never shifted between perspectives. 
And I saw a great benefit of that once you mastered it. How can you explain what the therapeutic process looked like if somebody was being a fly on the wall? (laughs) Well, I was very sure that I wanted to help myself. So from the get-go, I took it very seriously. And I can imagine your parents are making you do it. Sure, it might be more a little more resistance. But I was at the point where I was like, I need to fix myself. There's something wrong. I need to be better. I like what the Sucheta lady has to say. So let's do it. <laughs> and you gave me little homework assignments. And I remember thinking, what? This lady wants me to do homework? I can't even keep up with my own homework. But then I was like, okay, it's just little things here and there. And then I realized when we would come back to each session, we'd always catch up and you would ask me what had happened this past week as far as relationships go, the social aspect, as well as the whole academic side as well. You know, you would address the homework. And I always thought it was so interesting how my perception of what the assignment was, was never your perception at all. (laughs) First few, probably actually first six months, I'm not going to lie to myself here. And I was like, well, I thought you meant this. And then I really started questioning how I was thinking. And so hearing you explain what you meant by the assignment really put things into a different perspective. And I felt like things clicked. And I was like, oh, I see how someone with superior executive functioning skills sees this question. I'm going to start listening to her because I spent all week trying to figure out this silly homework assignment (laughs) that really wasn't as hard as I thought it was. I would overthink everything. And that's something that I always enjoy doing with you. I just really appreciate the fact that you look at all dimensions of my life, not just the educational side of it, because you felt the executive functioning, I mean, it is something that affects all domains of your life. And you address each of those in that session. So it's therapy, but also tutoring at the same time. Oh, thank you. That's very, very sweet of you. And uh, yeah, I think you, if I can quickly share with our listeners, the process to me in remediating executive function is not really making suggestions. making suggestions or listening to somebody and saying, I hear you and I'm sure this must feel really bad. But it's to say, how do I come to this conclusion of about my approach to life? So it's a process centered thinking. And in order to look at the processes, you need to have a great amount of data. So a lot of times, if you remember the initial when we started, I had you even document, write down everything you have done for one week. And you were like, what? I have never written down (laughs) anything that happens to me. And I said, even if it is, I watch TV, just mark how many hours or how many minutes and which show. And the idea behind that is to bring attention to these invisible aspects of essential way of being. And I think those who are oblivious to the essential way of being are not strategic when they are in the essential space where they need to be. And I think once you have that greater awareness, then you can regulate or control your time, control your actions. So, and you definitely were very diligent and hardworking. Let's talk quickly about some of the challenges that you had, which you kind of eluded. One was to understand expectations was really hard for you. You would try to fulfill something based on how, what you thought was expectation. But if you misunderstood, you had to rethink and you often ran out of ideas from executive function point of view. But tell me in terms of some of the roadblocks in terms of the actual work that we were doing in reconstructing more effective habits or reconstructing more flexible thinking, reining in that attention. What kind of difficulties did you run into as you were trying to learn these new skills? Sometimes, you know, the anxiety would set in and the wanting to be perfect. And it is a slow process, although it was actually relatively quick. It's not something that happens overnight. So there were a lot of tears in your office when you were helping me. And they were not really tears of sadness, just like tears of, oh my gosh, like I actually feel like I'm getting somewhere for the first time in forever. So as long as you can get through the tears and have that patience, I feel like that'll get you through a lot of the roadblocks. Because if you keep that negative attitude, if I'd kept it, I felt like I would have gotten nowhere. You just keep going with the flow. (laughs) Yeah, you are tremendously persistent. Man, that's just so incredible. (laughs) Something, I'll get it done. (laughs) Yes, yes. Oh, you are my ideal client. If everybody was like you, they will make their own progress. And I will just happen to be like a bystander watching it. (laughs) I like what you said earlier. You never told me what to do or what to say. That was the beauty of it. And I feel like that guides me as a teacher now. You always just um, gave me perspective, I think is the word. The perspective I needed to look at things differently to feel okay with it. Thank you. That's amazing. So let's talk quickly talk about what impact executive function challenges 
had on your social interpersonal life when you were younger, rather not when you were younger, when I was given your neuropsych testing, one of the things that really is a mark of some of these challenges is the gap between performance score and the verbal score. Typically, that gap indicates a difficulty in processing nonverbal information. And you seem to have that challenge, which I bet if we reevaluate you, you will show that that gap has been bridged, which is what I have seen many times after therapy. But the way this works is either one is it's a compensation, you're developing verbal processing, language-based linguistic processing. And when it comes to understanding space or visual spatial information, analysis, synthesis skills, reading between the lines, seeing facial expressions, understanding body language, tonal language, understanding patterns in the environment, all those skills are processed in the brain and it's exhibited through the performance score. And that gap often comes across as not reading people well. So did you see any of that or do you have examples of those kinds of social difficulties? Yes. Actually, it's funny that you say it about reading people. Maybe you remember my dad mentioning this, but after a little stunt that I got myself into in high school, I got in trouble. My dad was like, do you not know how to read people? And he got me a few books on how to read people. And I had to take notes on them as someone with severe executive dysfunction and ADD undiagnosed. (laughs) And I was sitting there having to read this book, trying to figure out how to read people and give this report back to my dad. And I still didn't figure it out. Like I went through high school and I just could not see through people, their intentions. I got myself into situations I could have avoided had I... Can you share that situation? Do you mind? No, not at all. So there's a group of girls in high school for... And this is a big one for me, very formative years, but... A group of girls in high school, you know, my mom kept warning me, hey, you know, I think they're just using you for this or that. And I was like, no, they love me. They're my best friends. We're great. And so I was so caught up in the fact that we were all best friends and nobody ever did anything bad that they were all talking behind my back as high schoolers generally do. And I just didn't even see the whole rejection coming when they kicked me out of their group. And it's something that my mom and my sister had both seen from miles away. And they told me, But I continued, I persisted. And my mom was like, I guess you're just one of those people that has to learn by doing and making those mistakes. But in retrospect, I could see that there were lots of signs pointing to what I perceived to be betrayal. And I felt like I got in that situation again, same exact situation when I went to college with a bunch of girls, same situation. So at that point, I really just started realizing girls are not always what they appear. And that's something that you helped through as far as making quality friends that want the best for not only us as friends, but also for me as a human being. So now I feel like I've gotten people around me that support me, hold me up, lift me to be the best person I possibly can be. But it's a challenge figuring out other people's intentions. Yeah. And we had an expert recently that I interviewed. Her name is Carol Westby. And She's an expert in something called theory of mind, which we have talked a lot about, is how to understand minds of others, intentions of others, other people's desires, and use that knowledge to predict what other people will do. And we are constantly playing this mental chess, which is trying to be one step or two step ahead of other people's behaviors by gauging that. And those who don't do that. Now, there are two reasons why this is really hard for people with ADHD. One is having very limited working memory because this requires a lot of room in your brain to hold on to these comparisons and then kind of think she thinks this, I think this of her thinking, she thinks this of my thinking of her thinking, this goes on and on. (laughs) And the second challenge is also it requires something called suppressing the impulse to only activate people's perspective. You need to really temporarily stop thinking from your perspective. But what happens with folks with ADHD, they tend to activate thoughts from their point of view, and they're not able to suppress that thought because it's so strong and overwhelmingly present. And so they really can't think from somebody else's point of view. And that makes them a little bit rigid. That makes them not get inflexible or argumentative and difficult to deal with. And secondly, they can't deal with difficult people with great amount of grace and flexibility. So that's what I think your sounds like you're describing some of these challenges to flexibly adapt or kind of see it from a mile away. Right. And that whole strategy that you mentioned and that you taught me instilled in me of trying to figure out like when you're in a, not an argument, but any kind of disagreement where the common ground is, that's something that I was completely incapable of identifying prior to working on strengthening those functioning skills. 
And it's made life so much easier, especially when I work with about, I don't know, 200 plus people a day, including teachers and 12, 13 year olds. Finding out where that common ground is, is a lifesaver. I mean, it really just appeases most people in the argument so that you can just move on and focus on the learning as opposed to focusing on trivial things. Yeah. And I think that mindset or that those behaviors that make you appear cooperative and collaborative kind of takes people's edge off and makes they are willing to do something for you because you appear like you will do the same. And to me, I call that generosity of spirit. You know, it just generates greater generosity of spirit from both parties. And you don't need ADHD or executive dysfunction to exercise that. But many times I think as uh, we have talked a lot about this and kind of monitored that is stress can really take away this perspective, a shift or feeling low or anxious or feeling really disappointed or left out. And social isolation can make this process very difficult as well. Another question I had was about, you know, you mentioned advocacy. Advocacy to me is a byproduct of that theory of mind. When you have the capacity to look at the world in a different way and understand minds of others. I always say to students that, uh, do you know people went into teaching because they deeply care about their students and you are a student, so they care about you. (laughs) And a lot of times I think people, students get stuck being that, oh my, I hate my teacher or my teacher hates me. Uh, And I said, the art of having your teacher change her mind about you is advocacy. Advocacy is not fighting for the right to be educated. Advocacy is making an appeal to the sensibility in another human to see what they may not see in you that is worth attending to. So tell me about your advocacy. You are in a wonderful position where you yourself have recognized the value of advocacy and employed it, deployed it, so to speak. And now you see students uh, who, in particularly middle school, may not be capable of this kind of advocacy, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I probably had about two meetings last week regarding students that have been struggling with their ADD. And as teachers, we have all discussed, you know, we're still not seeing this child reach his full potential, his or her full potential. And a lot of teachers want to point to, oh, they're just lazy. They don't care about their grade. And me going through therapy and actually having that feeling of being perceived as lazy once upon a time, I'm quickly to go to their defense. And I'm like, well, maybe they don't know how. And that's something that a lot of teachers struggle with. They want to quickly assume, oh, their parents did not instill a work ethic or they just don't feel like it. And I always want to explore the option of what if they don't know how, because I was that child and I didn't know basically how to advocate for myself. A child at that age, especially around 12, 13, let alone a young adult, trying to explain that you don't know how to do something, it's harder than it seems. It's harder than it seems. So I try to- It really is. Yes, it is. And I just feel for those students and I really want parents to know, you know, there's hope. Teachers, I'm trying from the inside, trying to change the mindset. And most are very open to this idea of executive dysfunctioning. And I try to encourage strategies in my classroom and other teachers' classrooms just to really help those students so they don't feel alone and they feel like they can actually do something with their lives. Well, they're so lucky to have you. Honestly, truly. <laughs> so now tell us, how have you brought these good and strong executive function skill set to your marriage? Marriage is a lot of managing goals of two people, right? Yes. How are you exercising these skills in this completely new terrain of your life? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say I'm any kind of expert. I'm still learning and growing. But it's been, what is it, I guess four months. And we have been doing very well. I feel like the main thing that we try to focus on is conflict resolution because, of course, learning to live with someone in close quarters and share space is beyond difficult, especially when you've been living alone most of your adult life. But we always... It's so true. It's true. It's hard. And there's times I just want to get away and that's okay. So I really just try my best to communicate with him and tell him how I'm feeling when I need alone time. He respects that as long as I communicate and don't just storm off and say, leave me alone. So he knows where I'm coming from. And if he wants that time alone as well, he can ask me for that and be like, hey, I really need this. I'm going to go do that. And I respect it. But communication is the ultimate goal. And that's kind of the path we're taking for a successful marriage for hopefully many, many years to come. Oh, please. I won't mention how long Todd is married and neither would I mention my marriage. But (laughs) yes, it's an ongoing process. That is actually, to me, the foundation of a strong marriage 
is to learn to communicate needs and be patient and uh, bring everything that goes into understanding the other. I think a lot of times we really struggle in a marriage because we are uh, we are exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. takes too much time to understand somebody's needs. <laughs> well, we went to marriage um, counseling. It was very interesting. And I'm sure you know it, the love language. So Scott and I took yeah. the quiz. And I was so enlightened that day when I realized, oh my gosh, you don't love someone the way you want to be loved. You love someone the way they want to be loved. Something so simple yet so profound to me. And that's really been something we've been trying to focus on as well. Yeah. And that also is like the whole concept of love language is literally changing perspective, right? Seeing not how I want to give love, but how that person would like to receive love. And if you're giving love and they're receiving love doesn't match, then somebody needs to change (laughs) and not change who they are, but change the way you deliver that message. And what a powerful tool that is. (laughs) Yes. So as we come to the end, tell us a little bit about, so you work with a lot of students and you mentioned, sounds to me like you're very empathic and you're very supportive of students and their challenges. What kind of classroom have you created with respect to self-control and their students' capacity to follow instructions, getting their work done on time, and relating to the peers and teachers, which can be a big challenge for these young learners if they don't have strong executive function abilities. Right. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and start with my relationship with my peers. I've been given the privilege, the opportunity to be a leader of my seventh grade science team. So I have a team of veteran teachers, whereas this is year three for me, you know, I'm brand new and they've all been doing this forever. And then I'm told that I'm going to be leading them. However, instead of taking it as a big boss moment, I really focused on how can we collaborate for the children? So I made my purpose, my intent for something we could all agree on, which was the kid's success, not me being in power or someone else doing all the work while I just sit back. It wasn't that. And I, I really just tried to set that collaborative norm in every single meeting that we have. And I really feel like it's been an effective way of relating to my peers. They tell me they appreciate me for what I've done. I trust them to do things that we talk about in meetings. It's just complete trust and collaboration that makes this team successful. So that's as far as my peers go, how I work with them on a daily basis. And as we talked about earlier, communicating through disagreements on finding that common ground. With the kids, Every day is a new day, (laughs) but (laughs) I do keep a routine. They're 12, 13 years old. So I just go in every day with like, well, let's see what's going to happen today. But I know I have my routine. I keep my classroom very structured. I actually teach all the inclusion classes at my school for math and science, which, yeah, it's a combination of special education students with general education students and the same environment. And the kids are used to this. They've been doing this since elementary school. And it's such a beautiful experience for me to see kids working with other children, despite the disability. Like there is no bias, no prejudice, none of that in the room, because the kids don't know who is struggling with what. We're all struggling together to learn. And that's the kind of classroom I try to create, one where people feel comfortable volunteering, asking questions, basically just engaging in their curiosity. But I stick to that routine just because I want to make sure that we have that predictability, but we still have that exploration aspect as well. I have to when you're doing science. I guess another big thing I see with students is their inability to complete long-term projects, which I actually do often. So I have incorporated rubrics that have, I guess, smaller deadlines and smaller tasks where they have to break things down so that they're not overwhelmed and wait to the last minute to do this huge project. I really try to work on time management, give them that classroom time, show them strategies on how to more effectively complete certain things that they have to do for this big overreaching project, kind of guide them in that aspect. The way I see it, they're not going to remember the curriculum I'm teaching them probably. (laughs) They'll learn it, but they're going to remember how I taught them to learn. That's my goal. Oh, I love that. And thank you for your kind heart and such a thoughtful reflection when you come to school and you take such a deep care of your students and it's going to pay off. I think particularly middle school is such a challenging time for these students who barely know themselves and now they're experiencing all these changes and challenges of becoming this inside out change person that they don't even know where it's going to lead. And to have that security to be with caring group of teachers is really a gift. So we all thank you for making a commitment. And we need people like you, by the way, in, yeah. in education who deeply care 
but are empathic about all learners are not made the same. As we close, anything fun you want to share in terms of your executive function management or what kind of little tricks that you still continue to use that has made a big difference? Or Oh man, I use all of the tasks. But this is the one that all, people always ask me, how do you get everything done? Because teaching is a very stressful job and there's a lot of demands and things people want you to do. Every day I make a list of three things and I prioritize them with top being the most important as to like who is going to be seeing this document. Is it my principal? Is it a bunch of people in the math department? And I try to prioritize those tasks that more people depend on first. And then the second and third task will be obviously just something probably more personal. But I do three things a day or else the job would be way too overwhelming because I could easily have a post-it note of 25 things to do every day. But <laughs> it's the way I go home to feel accomplished, post-it notes. <laughs> yeah. And imagine if you have three things done, then you have next three things and they are still looking very small yeah. and manageable. And uh, once they get them, you have already done nine, <laughs> three, three and three. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Well, thank you, Ansley, for your time and wonderful, thoughtful reflection and sharing your experience with all of us. And those who listen to this interview is, are going to greatly benefit. And a particularly one perspective that you brought as a girl with executive function challenges as a child and then eventually a young woman Generally, I don't mean to generalize, but there's women tend to put a lot more pressure on themselves and they typically compensate well in terms of their performance, but they tend to have deep anxious feelings about either not achieving all that they want to or feeling not adequate because they are still struggling. And you have given a voice to it. And just last strategy, as you describe, is the greatest way you are capturing how you have successfully understood yourself. So I deeply thank you for that. Of course, this has been awesome getting to speak with you about something that I'm passionate about. So I appreciate that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at cerebralmatters.com. That's cerebralmatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.